Psalm 88 is the last of the Psalms of the sons of Korah in the book of Psalms, and it is quite different from the other Psalms of the sons of Korah. Most of their Psalms are associated with the uh, the city of Jerusalem, with Zion, with pilgrimage, with uh, celebration, with festivals. However, this one is no doubt one of the darkest laments in all of the Psalter. Uh, the occasion can't be certain of a specific one, but it seems that the psalmist was near death, that he was almost as, as good as dead. And uh, if not physically, there was certainly an overwhelming sense of darkness. And uh, some have said that this might have been a psalmist suffering from clinical depression. Some of the language that's used is, is uh, what we might expect in that case. And so, indeed, it's classified as a lament. One thing I found fascinating is that there are three laments that I tend to think of together. The first is Psalm 22, which begins, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then if we double that, we get the number 44. And that's our first communal lament. It is essentially the nation of Israel saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken us? You've led us like, like sheep to be slaughtered. You've abandoned us. And then Psalm 88, if we take 44 and double it, we get Psalm 88, this very deep and dark song of lament. In fact, it's stated to be the darkest of all laments. There is very little hope or expression of trust. You know, every other lament at some point will have a statement of trust and confidence, but that is really lacking in this psalm. Uh, there are some hints, there are some glimmers, but nothing definitive that says the psalmist ever came out of this period of darkness. The tune, it says, is according to Mahalath Leanoth, which means the suffering of the affliction. So it must have been a, a sad minor tune. The psalm begins by saying, O Yahweh, God of my salvation. In fact, this is probably the, the most hopeful line of the psalm is the first one, where the psalmist acknowledges that God is he is God, and he is the God of salvation. I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. This is the first of three times the psalmist will cry out to God. It reminds us of how Jesus cried out three times in the garden. The psalmist does this day and night. So this is not a one-time trauma. This seems to be an ongoing experience of the psalmist. Notice the references to death. My life draws near to Sheol, the pit, the dead, the grave. These are all synonyms for death itself. As he lives on the brink of death, my soul is full of troubles. My life draws near to Sheol. I'm counted among those who go down to the pit. I'm a man who has no strength, like one set loose among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those who you remember no more. They're cut off from your hand. So a very dramatic statement of the psalmist being at the very brink of death itself, forgotten by God and by others. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Notice the change here in direction. Here he is accusing God, essentially, of placing him in this position. He is blaming God. Have you ever done that? Have you ever pointed the finger right back at God and said, it's your fault? God, it's your fault. You made me this way. You allowed this to happen to me. It's your fault. God, I didn't do this. I didn't deserve this. And verse 7 says, your wrath lies heavy upon me. You overwhelm me with all of your waves. I'm drowning. I'm getting pounded here uh, by the surf. Verse 8, you've caused my companions to shun me. You've made me a horror to them. So I don't even have friendship. I am utterly alone. Uh, God, you have driven me to the point where no one wants to be with me. I'm no fun, and so my companions don't know what to say, and they just don't call anymore, and they don't care anymore. They don't come around to see me. I'm shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. I can't escape. I'm trapped. There's no way out. I don't see any solution other than death. Death is the escape. You can see how someone on the, on the brink of suicide might pray this prayer. My eyes grow dim through sorrow. It's like I've cried so much. I've grieved so much. I can't anymore. My eyes grow dim. 
For every day I call on you, O Lord, I spread out my hands to you. There's the second request, the second time he says, I, I cry out every day. So at first it was day and night, now it's, now it's every day. I, I spread out my hands to you. Verses 10 through 12 are what in lament terminology we call motivation. It's, it's, it's when we try to rationalize with God and tell him, here's, here's why uh, you should respond to me. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the departed rise up and praise you? In other words, God, if you... If you allow me to go on like this and to die, then there's no way that I can ever praise you. I can't worship you if I'm dead. Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? In other words, if if I'm dead, I can't declare your love. I can't speak of your faithfulness if my body is no longer animated. Are your wonders known in the darkness or your righteousness in a land of forgetfulness? Can I tell of your wonders? Can I witness and testify what you've done if I'm dead? Of course not. So uh, these are reasons why God should answer his prayer and restore some hope. I should say that uh, the word Abaddon doesn't occur very often in Hebrew, uh, but here it is. I think it occurs five times in the Old Testament. It's uh, from the Hebrew root word to perish, typically a companion of Sheol. They go together, Sheol and Abaddon, a place of destruction. The Greek equivalent is Apollyon, and you might recall that from the book of Revelation, a verse that uh, we in America might remember, 9-11. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, destruction. And in Greek, he is called Apollyon. Also note, the parallelism in verse 12, the land of forgetfulness. Death is described as a land of forgetfulness because eventually you are forgotten. Go to any cemetery, visit the graves of those who have been gone for 80, 100 years, and there's no one, no one alive that remembers them. Their names are meaningless. And I mean, unless they're famous or something, there's a handful of people that we might remember, but the vast amount of humans who've lived on the history of this planet, are forgotten. Death is the land of forgetfulness. And then notice this metaphor of darkness that rages throughout the entire psalm. Uh, Regions dark and deep, my eyes grow dim. There are wonders known in the darkness. It's a very dark place that the psalmist is in. The third petition comes in verse 13, But I, O Lord, cry out to you in the morning, my prayer comes before you. The third time he prays. First he said, I cry day and night. And then he said, I cry all day. And now he says, in the morning. Now, perhaps that means that he's prayed all night. In other words, it's constant. He is constantly asking God for relief and he is getting none. Oh Lord, why do you cast my soul away? Why do you hide your face from me? There's, there's no resolution yet. And once more, God is blamed. God, you're the one that's looking away from me. You're the one that's ignoring me. It's it's your fault. I'm where I'm at. Afflicted and close to death from my youth up, I suffer your terrors. I'm helpless. Uh, you might say, well, maybe this is just uh, an acute case of depression and grief. But no, it seems like this is something he suffered with from his youth, that this has been a long-term issue. I, I And I I'm terrified. I'm helpless. Your wrath has swept over me. Your dreadful assaults destroy me. Again, he's blaming God. Ultimately, God, you could fix this. You are all powerful. You're good, but you do nothing. Verse 17, they surround me like a flood all day long. They close in on me together. So he is surrounded uh, with a, like a flood. Uh, they closed in on him. He's compressed. And yet, verse 18, you've caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. So it's the absence of human companionship in verse 18, in the presence of a flood, of pressure, of drowning, of loss, grief, all of those things. And yet he is utterly alone, not a friend in this world who wants to be with him. In fact, and this is the way the NIV translates it, darkness is my closest friend. Darkness is my Throughout history, there have been individuals who have struggled with what uh, was called in the 16th century poem by St. John of the Cross, the dark night of the soul. No doubt uh, he was not the first or the last to experience that. Um, a spiritual crisis, a, a wrestling with depression, with darkness that many saints have in common, would identify with. And 
my prayer is that this psalm, if if this is you, that this would give you words to express when you're in that place. You might say it's how do you pray a psalm like this, a psalm that has no hope at all. I think this the fact that you're still praying means that there is hope. The psalmist is still praying. He's still crying out. The psalm reminds us, of course, of Jesus' prayer in the garden, absolute dark night of his soul, and yet where he was still able to pray, not my will, but yours be done, a prayer of surrender and trust. Several years ago, Tim Hughes wrote a song that was based on this psalm. I happened to hear it at a time in my life of great anxiety and darkness and fear, And so it meant a lot to me, and I hope you'll take a moment to find this song and take a listen to it, because it is drawn directly from this psalm. And yet it has a very powerful chorus that says, Yet I will praise you. Even though I don't have answers, even though I have no one to cling to, I will choose to praise you. I will choose to trust even when I can't see my next step, even when I'm in absolute darkness, and the tears fall, still I will trust in you. Take a listen to this song, and uh, if you are not one who is suffering from this kind of anxiety or darkness, you know someone that is, and so be there for them. They need your words. They need your presence. They need your prayers. Be with them. Don't be the companion who shuns the one who is discouraged and anxious and fearful. Be with them. Be the light in their darkness.